Hi, welcome new listeners and welcome back if you have been here before. Hope you had a wonderful Easter break. This week's episode definitely took its sweet, sweet time making its debut after an extremely relaxing long weekend. In this week's episode, we will touch on the largest intra-African trade that was completed through blockchain, the ongoing crisis in the town of Palma in Mozambique, a promising vaccine for HIV, and... We also celebrate the recent great news that asteroid Apophis will not hit the Earth for another 100 years at least. Dodged. I'm your host, Yemi, and every week I bring you Overlook stories from all around the world. As you will see from this episode, the stories include the good, the bad, and even sometimes the weird. With that said, let's get right into the stories for this week. The Eastern and Southern African Trade and Development Bank, or TDB, and the OCP Group have completed what is considered the first ever large-scale intra-African transaction using blockchain. The bank, along with the OCP Group, which is the largest phosphate mining and leading fertilizer company, jointly announced a fertilizer trade transaction that was executed using blockchain. This makes the OCP Group the first African company to execute an intra-African trade transaction using blockchain. This is not the first time that the bank, TDB, had used blockchain to finance transactions. TDB became the first African development financial institution to complete a live end-to-end trade finance transaction using blockchain in October 2019, when it financed the importation of 50,000 tons of white sugar from India into the region that it serves. The latest transaction will see fertilizers shipped from Morocco to Ethiopia. The Intra-African Transaction Initiative is part of the OCP's digitization strategy. The strategy aims to reduce the trade finance gap in Africa and boost trade between African countries through digital inclusion. The initiative is focused primarily in the fertilizer sector where OCP operates. The deal was executed using DLTL Ledger's platform. The platform is run by a Singaporean company that describes itself as a leading independent fintech platform for trade and supply chain digitization and financing blockchain. The digital platform makes it possible for all parties to carry out these import-export trades digitally and in under two hours. Traditional transactions typically take over three weeks to complete because physical documents usually need to be moved from suppliers through the banking system to the buyer. With border and airport closures as the order of the day, these three-week delays became twice as long once the pandemic hit. This transaction is particularly significant for Ethiopia, a country where agriculture plays a critical role in the economy and represents about 31% of the country's gross domestic product and almost 70% of its total employment. Fertilizers are fundamental to Ethiopia's agricultural sector and about half of the fertilizer that it needs is imported from the OCP group in Morocco. The northern town of Palma in Mozambique has been attacked and overrun by the Islamic State group. The latest attack is one of many in a region that has seen escalating levels of insurgency over the last few years. Thousands of people are currently estimated to be missing from the town, which once held about 70,000 people before the latest attack that started on Wednesday, the 24th of March. These recent attacks reportedly started after the multinational oil and gas company, Total, announced that it would resume work on its natural gas projects outside the town. The project is located near Mozambique's northeastern border with Tanzania. Rebel attacks that happened earlier in the year prompted Total to suspend work on the project to extract gas from offshore sites in January. Despite reports that the insurgents intentionally cut off most communications in and out of Palma, as well as the surrounding area, some residents were able to get emergency messages out using satellite phones. The reports so far have been, in short, gruesome. From stories about a woman who had to give birth on her own in a bush and cut off the umbilical cord using a nearby tree branch while on the run, to reports that people who were hiding in the bush were attacked by crocodiles. The stories I read were horrifying. 
So let your imagination fill in the blanks about the hard to describe atrocities that have happened so far, given that tens of thousands of people have been displaced. Like most stories on this podcast, where I touch on just enough to keep you informed, I encourage you to take a deeper look into the intricacies of what is going on. The province of Cabo Delgado, where Palma is located, has seen a rise in Islamist insurgency since 2017 that has now been linked to the Islamic State. The battle for Palma is similar to how rebels seized the port Mosimboa da Priya, which is 50 kilometers or 31 miles south of Palma in August. The rebels infiltrated men into the town to live among residents and then launched a three-pronged attack. Intense fighting continued for more than a week until the rebels eventually controlled the town center and then the town's port. The town is still held by the rebels till today. With respect to Total's project, the recent violence has called the fate of the entire project, which is one of the African continent's biggest private investments into question. Total paid nearly four billion US dollars for 26.5% stake in the project in 2019. It had planned to start gas shipments in 2024, but the deteriorating security situation has made this goal seem more and more unlikely. Total has now pulled its remaining workforce from the sites near Palma and is providing refuge and food to about 10,000 people in its Mozambique LNG site. The company has also reportedly arranged for flights and a ferry to evacuate people from the site and is able to transport, and is able to transport more than 1,000 people per day, mainly by sea. The battle for Palma is expected to drastically worsen the humanitarian crisis in Mozambique's northern Cabo Delgado province. The insurgents began as a few bands of disaffected and unemployed young Muslim men, but have since become more and more coordinated. Though they are known locally as Al-Shabaab, they have no known affiliation with Somalia's jihadist rebels of the same name. Since 2017, the violence of Mozambique, a nation with more than 30 million people, has been blamed for the deaths of more than 2,600 people and caused an estimated 670,000 people to flee their homes. When you hear the word baguette, what comes to mind? Do you think of the elongated French bread? It's rather iconic, isn't it? Well, the French think so too. So much so that France has submitted its bread as its candidate for UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage status. France's Ministry of Culture said in a statement that it had chosen the baguette over the zinc roofs of Paris and the Beau de Abois, a wine festival in the Jura region, to protect the traditional savoir faire behind the ubiquitous French product. According to the ministry, the number of independent bakeries has fallen significantly. In 1970, there were 55,000 independent bakeries across the country, but there are only 35,000 today. This has often been to the benefit of industrially produced baguette. The baguette, an emblem of French cultural heritage, is a long loaf made from only four ingredients. Flour, water, salt, yeast, or sourdough. While the ingredients are simple, its manufacture requires special know-how and skill, which involves solid training and extensive experience. Each baker... By playing with the terroir, the dosage, the kneading, the pointing, the fermentation time, shaping, and baking, will obtain a unique baguette. There are as many different baguettes as there are bakers. When it is made according to the rules, it must have a crispy crust and a soft honeycombed crumb. The origin of the world-famous long loaf dates back to the 17th century, but its use became more widespread during the 20th century Nowadays, it is estimated that about 320 baguettes are eaten every second in France, amounting to an annual consumption of about 10 billion, according to the data site called PlanetScope. The National Confederation of French Bakers and Patisseries welcomed the announcement with a sense of pride that after four years of work, their submission was chosen. They also hope that the announcement will encourage young people to choose the profession of a baker. UNESCO's decision on the application will not be released until the year 2022. 
Amazing news. A landmark HIV vaccine has passed phase one of human trials and the results have shown that it was successful in 97% of the participants. HIV, or the human immunodeficiency virus, affects more than 38 million people globally. It also is one of the most difficult viruses to target with a vaccine, in large part because of its unusually fast mutation rates, which allows it to constantly evolve and evade the immune system. The news about the efficacy of this new vaccine was reported in IAVI and the Scripps Research. According to the organizations, the vaccine successfully stimulated the production of the rare immune cells needed to generate antibodies against the fast-mutating HIV virus. This positive response happened in 97% of the participants in the study who received the vaccine. The tremendous achievement from the study sets the stage for additional clinical trials that will seek to refine and extend the approach. The long-term goal is to create a safe and effective HIV vaccine with the possibility of using the same approach to make new and better vaccines beyond HIV. As a next step, the collaborators are partnering with the biotechnology company Mordena to develop and test the mRNA-based vaccine that harnesses the same approach to produce the same beneficial immune cells. According to the team, using mRNA technology could significantly accelerate the pace of HIV vaccine development as it did with the vaccines for COVID-19. As it did with the vaccines for COVID-19. Researchers also believe that the approach could be applied to vaccines for other challenging pathogens such as influenza, dengue, Zika, hepatitis C viruses, and malaria. Dr. William Sheaf, a professor and immunologist at Scripps Research and the executive director of the vaccine design at IAVI's Neuro- Neutralizing Antibody Center, whose laboratory developed the vaccine, presented the results at the International AIDS Society HIV Research for Prevention virtual conference that was held on February 3rd. In another piece of great news, the Earth has been declared safe from the asteroid called Apophis for another 100 years. The asteroid, called 99942 Apophis, is a near-Earth asteroid that was discovered in the year 2004. It had been identified as one of the most hazardous asteroids that could impact the Earth. But you will be happy to know that the new results from a radar observation campaign combined with precise orbit analysis have helped astronomers to conclude that Apophis will not hit the Earth in 2068 as they had previously feared. The asteroid is estimated to be about 1,100 feet across and was named after the Egyptian god of destruction. Scientists at NASA were recently able to make even more precise estimates when the asteroid flew by the Earth in March. It allowed them to confidently rule out any impact risk until long, long after 2068. Though it is not expected to make contact, NASA expects it to pass less than 20,000 miles or 32,000 kilometers from our planet's surface on April the 13th, 2029. During that close approach, Apophis will be visible to observers on the ground in the Eastern Hemisphere without the use of a telescope or binoculars. NASA explains that this will be an unrivaled opportunity for astronomers to get a close-up view of a solar system relic. This sounds like we should all be making a note in our diaries about an amazing night sky watch opportunity in about eight years' time. A new study from Global Forest Watch found that the destruction of primary rainforests increased 12% in the year 2020, impacting ecosystems that store vast amounts of carbon and shelter abundant biodiversity. Primary forests are forests of native tree species, where there are no clear visible indications of human activities and the ecological process has not been significantly disturbed. 
Brazil saw the worst losses, three times higher than the next highest country, which was the Democratic Republic of Congo. According to the report, which used satellite data from the University of Maryland, the driving factor of deforestation has been a combination of demand for commodities, increased agriculture, and climate change. The report registered the destruction of 12.2 million hectares of tree cover in 2020. Of that, 4.2 million hectares, an area the size of the Netherlands, occurred within humid tropical primary forests, which are especially important for carbon storage and biodiversity. The findings did, however, show signs of hope, particularly in Southeast Asia. Indonesia and Malaysia saw downward trends for deforestation after implementing regulations such as temporary palm oil license ban. The study suggested that COVID-19 restrictions may have had an effect when it came to illegal harvesting because forests were less protected or the return of large numbers of people to rural areas. If you would like to learn more, the interactive data is actually available on their website at www.globalforestwatch.org forward slash map. It is interesting. You can filter the data by how the forest has changed, how much tree cover has been lost, by how the land is being used, for example, logging or mining, the climate of the region, the biodiversity and the biodiversity of the area. You can also filter by country and even zoom into specific areas. It is very informative, especially if you're into data visualization like I am. Finally, to end our week, LinkedIn, the world's largest professional network, has announced that it will add stay-at-home mom and other caretaker titles to its website selection. Any parent that has taken time away from work to care for children or for family members can empathize with the difficulty of having to explain the gap in work history. Until now, there has been no way to easily include an explanation. According to Fortune, LinkedIn was encouraged to make these changes after an article by Heather Bolin went viral last month. In her article, Bolin explained how a simple fix by LinkedIn could help millions of women trying to re-enter the workforce. In the article, Bolin describes her own experience trying to reboot her career, which had been in corporate at Starbucks after staying home to raise her children for a period of time. LinkedIn and professional LinkedIn and professional websites like it have a tendency to favor descriptions for paid work rather than unpaid work. There aren't any pre-populated options for unpaid events on LinkedIn to identify maternity leave, paternity leave, adoption leave, sick leave, bereavement leave, elderly care leave, for long-term injury or illness, education, retraining, volunteering, long-term travel, a sabbatical, or even for, or even to stay at home to teach kids who are homeschooling as a result of the pandemic. In response to the criticism about a lack of flexibility on its platform, LinkedIn is adding the job titles like stay-at-home mom and caregiver to its list of possible options. The site is also removing the requirements that resume entries must be linked to a specific employer. As part of the review, LinkedIn has also developed a dev as part of the review, LinkedIn has also developed a dedicated field for users to include gender pronouns in their profiles. This modification has been requested a lot by LinkedIn users who had worked around the gender pronoun feature by placing their pronouns after their names. Another change is the addition of a separate resume section for employment gaps that are plainly separated from the rest of the resume and the choice to select 10 various kinds of breaks like family leave or hospital leave. LinkedIn is also not requiring that any resume entries such as homemaker are linked to. So that's good news. Have you faced challenges re-entering the workforce after taking some time away? How are you able to navigate updating your resume and LinkedIn profile if you have one? Let me know in the comment section of the blog or on our Tunica Media Instagram page. With that, that's all for this episode. To end this episode, here is a gentle reminder that you are awesome and you matter. Have a great week. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to tune in every week for a new episode. Overlooked is a Tunica Media production, which also includes shows like Africa in My Kitchen, with more on the way. 
So follow Tunuka Media on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter to be in the loop. Until next time, have yourself a great week ahead.